Welcome to the Women Changing the World podcast, a podcast on a mission to bring you some of the most amazing women I know who are doing incredible things to generally make the world a better place. From corporate sustainability to straight up magic and everything in between, you'll meet the real life humans who are birthing the new. I'm your host, Liz Best, and I'm here to amplify the stories and voices of women who are changing the world. Welcome to another episode of the Women Changing the World podcast. Today, I'm so excited to sit down with Radhika Lalit. She is a Chief Strategy Officer for Mission Possible Partnership, who has done so much cool stuff to accelerate climate action and climate solutions. Uh, We talk about everything from how one question she got asked during her first ever environmental summer internship shaped the trajectory of her life to how um, collaboration can help us address climate action, ways that more women can join the fight against climate change, uh, and advice that she would give her younger self. Uh, I just know you're going to enjoy our conversation as much as I did. It was truly a dose of hope and optimism for the future and climate action. Um, I can't wait to hear what you think. Welcome to a new episode of the Women Changing the World podcast. I am so excited to be sitting down today with Radhika Lalit. Uh, she's a Chief Strategy Officer for Mission Possible Partnership, who is doing such cool work in the world. Um, Radhika, I'm so excited to have you here today. Liz, thank you so much for having me here, and hi, everyone. Uh, super, super excited to be speaking with Liz and the rest of you on this important topic. Totally, totally. Um, and if you wouldn't mind, um, would love for you to give our listeners a brief introduction to you and who you are and what you do. Absolutely. So Liz, uh, I'm the Chief Strategy Officer for the Mission Possible Partnership, uh, or as we like to call it, MPP. And it's a global alliance of climate leaders dedicated to accelerating the the clean energy transition uh, and specifically in those seven industries that are traditionally known as hard to abate. So we're looking at material sectors as well as heavy transportation sectors. uh, And and to name a few on the material side, we have the steel sector, the cement sector, the aluminum sector and the chemical sector. And on the heavy transportation bit, we're looking at shipping, aviation, and heavy trucking. And just to give you a little more higher level view, I've I've been working in the climate space for now close to eight years. uh, And I've worked across strategy, finance, policy, and innovation, uh, focused primarily on building high impact collaboration platforms like MPP or the Mission Possible Partnership, uh, as well as the Global Cooling Prize and the Center for Climate Line Finance. And this has been primarily during my time at RMI. Uh, And to uh, share just my origins, I am originally from Delhi, India, uh, but right now I'm living in Jersey City, New Jersey. (laughs) Amazing. A a world away from Delhi, India. Uh, I'm guessing, (laughs) having not spent much time in Jersey City. Yes, uh, I'm. I'm. I kind of live in those dual worlds. I I really enjoy, uh, you know, having to meet my family in Delhi, India, but also sort of being able to live, uh, in Jersey, in, uh, you know, in the New York City area more broadly, uh, and experience life here. Amazing, amazing. Well, I have to ask because this is my favorite first question, um, and it's a big one, um, but because this is the Women Changing the World podcast. Um, if you could change one thing about the world, what's the one thing that you would like to change? This is not going to be a surprise, but if there's one thing that I could change about the world, it has to be that every uh, that we have gender equality in the world. I think women empowerment and emancipation are key 
to creating a better world um, for everyone. And I think we need to start today by giving women a level playing field of both opportunities and recognition for their work. Oh my goodness. Well, I could not agree more with that. (laughs) I feel feel like having more women in positions of power, more feminine leadership, like really does feel like one of the key uh, answers to so many of the challenges that are facing us today. Um, So thank you so much for calling that out. Absolutely. With you on that. (laughs) Also, just as context for our listeners, we are talking during uh, International Women's Day week. Uh, so I think this is especially top of mind for both of us. Absolutely. And, and I am so excited to be speaking with you, uh, you know, around this day, because this is what gives me hope uh, that, that, you know, women are part of the conversation for changing the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, thank you. That's like totally what gives me hope as well. Um And, you know, I have to ask, so uh, for those of you listening, uh, Radhika has some very cool credentials. She's recently been featured on BBC. Uh, You've been recognized as a Generation Climate Leader. Uh, I know you recently won another Women's Leadership Award. Um, So I would love to hear, as someone who's like, you know, being featured in these very cool ways, um, (laughs) what is your day-to-day of doing the work that you do currently look like? Thanks, Liz. And my day to day probably looks like the day to day of most other working women. But, uh, you know, to to be very honest with you, uh, you know, in my work, I've been I work very closely with other really passionate people. uh, And I'm very lucky for that to really come up with market based solutions and ideas to drive the clean energy transition. And if you ask me, I see myself more as an intrapreneur who is working, you know, within the constraints of my organization, uh, but really working to build those high impact industry uh, and, and platforms and coalitions, which leverage the strengths of all partners to deliver innovation solutions to climate change. And so uh, partnerships and problem solving is is at the very core of my day to day. Um, and, and the rest of my time, I actually spend, um, you know, with my team uh, on team building, um, on, on prioritization and project management. Awesome. Awesome. I feel like uh, there's so many entrepreneurs uh, who are working on <laughs> in the climate <laughs> space and in the sustainability space more broadly. And I think it's like really just it's such important work. And a lot of it is really can be things like project management that are maybe a lot less sexy than some of the shinier <laughs> moments. Right. Um, so, of course, I also do a lot of research, but, but um, you know, it's just it's just wonderful to be able to build high impact coalitions and, and you need a lot of those soft skills in order to build, uh, you know, these coalitions uh, and, and create these platforms for solutions. So I'm, I'm very excited. I'm, I'm getting that opportunity within my current work profile. Totally, totally. I think that's so cool. Um, well, I love to ask people on the podcast, I've, I've had a little glimpse into your story already, which I personally think is so cool, um, but would love to hear how you came to be where you are today. And really the invitation is like, take up space, give us the long version, <laughs> tell your story. <laughs> Great. Well, since you want to hear it, um, it, my story really starts in India. Um, and, and this is in the summer of uh, 2007. Uh, my mother uh, forced me in, and this is when I was actually doing my engineering education, uh, totally unrelated to climate change, because my engineering focused on electronics and communications. Um, but what we, you know, I was in a conversation with my mom and my mom said she would love me to go to an NGO and, and work over the summer. And I resisted. I said, well, I don't think the NGO that you're sending me to has anything to do with electronics and communications um, <laughs> because it was an environmental NGO. And, and um, uh, she said, she insisted. She said, you're going. She handed me the tickets. She literally boarded me, uh, you know, on a train and said, there you go. Uh, and so there I was, um, you know, begrudgingly sort of uh, I entered uh, this village uh, in the upper reaches of, you know, somewhere in Uttarakhand. Um, it's called Dehradun. Uh, and it's, you know, I landed on that train station and 
you know, I remember candidly, like my mom uh, calling me from from home and saying, "Have you reached?" I said, "Yes," but this is this is not fun. You know, you just send me away for for so long for for something that I haven't enrolled myself into, and um, you know, fast forward a couple of weeks, I was actually working. Uh, with an NGO called HESCO, uh, which was looking into rural sustainability and rural livelihoods. Um, and I was just fascinated by what I learned. It's, you know, it's one of those light bulb moments in your life when you're like, wow, the reality just strikes you of like, I was living in a bubble. Um, you know, I've primarily been in, in Delhi, and in uh, Delhi, which is the capital, which is a city. And so having to, having to actually, uh, having to work in, in a village and, and see the lives of people who are living there was was quite different to me. Uh, and that's when the realities of the, the real India struck me. Um, and I, I remember, um, you know, I was tasked with interviewing villagers about uh, their lifestyles and what do they do in the day and, um, you know, how do they sustain their livelihoods. And there was just women in that village. All the men actually... Uh, had left to do their day jobs and in, in government jobs in, in the cities and the women were left in the villages kind of doing agriculture. Uh, and so I remember candidly, there's this one female who, uh, who, who, who asked me at the end of the interview, great, now that you know our problems and you know how we do everything here, what are you going to do about it? Mm. And it's in that moment, Liz, like uh, my entire life changed because I was, I, I was clueless. I, you know, I was just there for an internship. I wasn't there to make a change or for any, you know, for make make their lives better in any way. But but that's what really uh, catalyzed the change in my mind, like the way I think, the way I wanted to approach problem solving, the way I wanted to use my skill sets for um, in, in the future. And so I came back so motivated uh, from that internship. I set up a huge organization called the Youth for a Cause uh, within uh, my my college, my engineering college. And, you know, the idea really was to set up a, a solutions exchange platform to address some of India's most pressing social and environmental problems. Uh, I grew the network from, you know, me, my friends to over uh, a thousand people, a thousand volunteers uh, in the next couple of years. And, you know, it's been over... 10 years that that uh, platform is is running is self sustained and i just feel really proud that i was able to contribute that but but that you know being with that organization and starting that organization really uh, left me thinking i need to upskill myself i need to learn more i need to understand how i can solve these problems for on the climate on the climate change issues on the environment issues and and that's uh, that's where my journey starts essentially and and you know ever since i did my mba in business sustainability i um uh, you know I, I learned more about climate change at a time when climate change was not really acknowledged mm -hmm. <laughs> as much as it is today um and then i worked for a for a not for profit think tank in india an energy think tank where I got to work as a sustainability consultant to several Fortune 500 corporations. And this was really across uh, a number of industries. And what it led me to do is, uh, you know, I, I was able to, with the support of the leadership within my organization, then start India's first Chief Sustainability Officers Forum. And what it was, was a, a year long engagement with industry leaders um, from around 25 Indian corporations to to really establish the business case for sustainability and business case for sustainable development. Uh, I was able to sort of work on reports, but also pilot projects. And one of the interesting ones that we think we did end up developing were, you know, providing solar solutions, lighting solutions to over 200 unelectrified um, households in India. Uh, as part of this work and, and there was many other things that we were able to accomplish but you know that one remains close to heart um, and then you know having been in these boardroom discussions what I realized is that all the CSOs all the CEOs are basically uh, grappling with you know the chicken and egg problem of does the business go first or the policy goes first mm -hmm. and in most cases you know you want the policy to be that signal that market signal based on which the industry reacts. And at least that was the reality long back. 
um, or has been the reality actually for the longest time, uh, but it's changed now. <laughs> um, and, yeah, and totally. Well, and actually quick, uh, clarifying question there. I know that like there, there's a law in India that mandates some, some CSR activity was the work that you were doing like before that law came out or after. It was exactly the same time that I started this forum that that law came out. So it became oh, so much easier to yeah. build that too. <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally. So interesting. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, that's what led me to think that policy is important. And I wanted to know more. I, have, I hadn't been exposed to that. So I, I didn't then started to explore, like, what can I do? Uh, to do, to learn more and so I did my master's in international policy studies at Stanford University uh, where I did a concentration in energy and environment and uh, I was really able to upskill myself on that piece as well and, and get a really nuanced perspective of how does policy play a, an important role in driving the markets um, and so that was that was super interesting and enriching and then after that I I um, I started my work at RMI, uh, which is a leading, uh, again, as we like to call it, the think and do tank, um, <laughs> where we like to focus on uh, not just the thought leadership or the thinking, but also the actual market engagement and um, catalyzing where, where we're actually in the market in some places to scale ideas for the energy transition. And, you know, over the last five and a half years that I've been with RMI, I've, I've led projects, projects with the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, on deep energy retrofits. So within the building space, I've worked with the New York City Mayor's Office of Sustainability on their 8050 goal, which is around reducing 80% of the city's emissions by 2050. I've worked on um, specific finance initiatives with, uh, you know, engaging with mortgage underwriters like the Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae on their d duty to serve program, which uh, with the objective of serving the affordable housing in rural markets. Uh, in the U.S. And, and thinking about how we can incorporate energy risks in the traditional home mortgage process so that the, the invisible nature of energy is kind of uh, more tangible to homeowners. Um, and then, uh, you know, most recently, I helped co-found um, the Global Cooling Prize, which I know we're going to talk about uh, in a brief bit, uh, or I, I would love to talk about in a brief. Uh, yes, I definitely uh, want to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I also helped, uh, you know, within RMI, like I said, I've, I've kind of been an entrepreneur. I helped launch the Center for Climate Line Finance with some of the biggest banks, uh, such as Wells Fargo, Goldman Sachs, Bank of America and JP Morgan Chase, um, where, you know, the idea was how can the financial sector help uh, transition industry clients towards the net zero carbon future? And, and I helped sort of create the framework for what, what a center of excellence there could look like. Uh, and then right now, like I said, I'm the chief strategy officer of Mission Possible Partnership. And in my role, I am basically um, supporting uh, the seven sector platforms uh, across industry, heavy industry and heavy transportation uh, to help them decarbonize. So setting up these seven net zero industry platforms and uh, creating the solutions, um, creating solutions and tools to help these industries decarbonize faster than they would traditionally be able to on their own. So interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I just think that work is interesting. It also sounds like you've done so much in five and a half years. Um, <laughs> and definitely want to come back to the Global Cooling Prize and Global Cooling Challenge. Um, but first, I'm, I'm curious, especially, you know, given the, what you're working on right now to decarbonize some of these sectors, I mean, gosh, climate change is having such a big impact on our lives right now in ways that I think a lot of us who've been working in this space for the past decade plus did not necessarily expect to happen so soon. Um, what is your thinking on like the systemic shifts that are most important for us in order to take meaningful action on the climate crisis? It's such an important question, Liz. And you know, I've been thinking about it as well in my work, and uh, I think the conclusion I've I've come to is that we really need to fundamentally rethink and reassess some of the existing, uh, you know, pillars and structures of our modern society from various lenses, essentially to take into impact 
uh, take into account the externalities and unintended consequences of our action. Like the impact of it needs to be now, uh, you know, justified into our actions. And and what that really means is, you know, businesses can no longer be just about the bottom line or profits. Businesses now need to think about the impact they're creating on the environment, on the society, and both directly and indirectly through their actions. I think we need to similarly, like, change the way we think about our capital markets and how they operate and how we finance our economy. Um, There is a need for us to uh, fundamentally take into account what what, what carbon is and and what the impact is and see how we can incorporate carbon pricing into the way we do business. Because unless you give it a value, it is very difficult for businesses to take action. Mm -hmm. And so there is the huge role of, 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 um, really being able to um, understand how do we price carbon more effectively to take action. And then lastly, I think as customers of the various products and uh, as customers of the services that we're receiving, we really need to think hard about how we consume the products that we do and the services that we take um, and redefine the way we want the future to look like. And so I think the systemic systemic shifts that you're talking about have to come with changing the way we do business, changing the way we finance the real economy, and changing the way we consume as customers of this economy. Absolutely. I mean, I couldn't agree more. I think those are all really important levers for us to pull. I'm also curious, because you mentioned it earlier, um, how your thinking has evolved or what your current thinking is on the role of policy in catalyzing some of these shifts? Yeah, policy, Yeah, you're absolutely right. Like, I think that's something that I didn't talk about, but policy is super important, right? Like the signal the policymakers give to the market is what creates and builds confidence uh, in the markets to take, uh, take risks, honestly, because these are not, solutions that have existed you know as we look in the rear view mirror these are solutions that we need to create and for that there needs to be market certainty both in terms of demand but also policy so policies need to be in place that signal market confidence policies um uh, you know need to be placed in terms of carbon pricing as i talked about we need to have a certain uh, carbon price in order to signal to the market that the cha- change needs to happen uh Policies need to be in place in terms of encouraging development and R&D uh, and deployment of, of new technologies that need to be in place in order for us to transition. You know, the technologies such as um, hydrogen uh, and hydrogen-based, say, for example, steel production, like there's only pilots. We need to do so much more in order to sort of commercialize these technologies at scale in order for businesses to make profits. Um, and then, you know, I would say on the demand side, I, I, there is a need for policymakers to, uh, you know, think similarly to they d- did in the way that they reacted to the pandemic, where their their advanced market commitments uh, mm-hmm. for these technologies, so that the uptake is reasonable uh, and at scale, and that the costs fall down. Uh, because let's face it any change that we make today is going to come at a higher cost for the end consumer, a higher cost premium for most businesses. Um, and unless policy intervenes and makes it easier for the markets to react, um, it, it's, it's, it's not going to fly. <laughs> and so we need uh, policies to sort of take a role, uh, uh, policymakers to take a, a more proactive role towards um, the transition because businesses are now on the table. Definitely, definitely. I think it's so interesting and so beautifully articulated. I um, worked in in public policy early, the earliest point in my career. And I think, you know, in a lot of ways, too, from an academic perspective, always, I think I, I felt working in corporate sustainability, at least initially, like it was so cool to be in the private sector and be in a space where like, innovation could just happen so fast. Mm-hmm. Um. And I feel like the longer I've worked in this space, the more critical, the more clear it is how critical policy that supports business action on climate 
is. <laughs> Just as you said, to give confidence in the market to incentivize some of this innovation at scale. And I think the pandemic is such a perfect, um, it's such a an astute example of like how government intervention did help spur the change that we wanted to see and needed to see. Yeah, I think the, the, you know, the elephant in the room nobody talks about is climate change, similar to the pandemic, like as the pandemic has disrupted lives, so will climate change in the near future. And, and we need to address it now before there is a complete disruption of markets of, of, of the day to day, honestly, of the way we live. Definitely, definitely. I mean, yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, and I think it, it's something we're already starting to see in a lot of ways that feel surprising. Surprising and not surprising. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been meaning to expand the circle of amazing women in your network, but it's been hard to find the time to connect consistently? Are you a member of a small team creating a big impact and you wish you had additional brains to tap to think strategically about what's next? Are you craving personal growth, community, and magic in your personal and professional life but feeling like you don't know where to find it? Imagine if you had dedicated time and space to build relationships with other badass women in impact. Imagine if you had access to a brain trust of rock stars who are ready to help you solve any challenge, personal or professional. Imagine if you had an extended team of like-minded women cheering you on, hyping you up, opening doors, and helping you make your wildest dreams come true. Imagine if you took the time to really invest in yourself and be intentional about the impact you are here to make. The Girls Club Mastermind is a five-month mastermind for women who are changing the world. It is an intimate community of powerful women who are dedicated to lifting each other up. They are your hype women, your cheerleaders, and your extended team. The next round of the Girls Club Mastermind kicks off in April, and you don't want to miss it. Head to elizabethbest.com slash girlsclub. That's E-L-I-S-A-B-E-T-H-B-E-S-T dot com slash girlsclub to learn more and apply today. But related to this, um, I know you, you mentioned the, the Global Cooling Challenge and Global Cooling Prize, um, and I, it's a pun, but I think it's so cool. Um, <laughs> so for, for people who are listening who are not familiar, what is it? Tell us about it. Yeah, so let me let me put you through a scenario where, you know, if you could imagine, if you could make the most commonly sold, you know, entry-level room air conditioner that everyone buys at least four to five times more energy efficient and one that uses, say, a refrigerant that has low or no global warming potential, you're looking at obviating the need for 2,000 gigawatts of power generation capacity, which is equivalent to the total global power uh, plant capacity in operation today. So all the coal plants today in operation equals that. So instead of sort of trying to find the needle in a haystack, we decided to let the needle find us. And this (laughs) is why we sort of established the Global Cooling Prize, which is an innovation competition launched by RMI, the Government of India and Mission Innovation in 2018, to do that, right, to to discover what, uh, what is the next frontier of air conditioning. This prize was a three million dollar prize initiated, um, you know, in which through which we invited innovators from around the globe to submit ideas uh, for an affordable yet breakthrough cooling solution uh, that had at least five times less climate impact than what's sold in the market today. Um, which and, is and how- so ambitious, and also like I, if I'm remembering correctly, like the the air conditioners that many of us use today have like, there's really been very little innovation before this on in that space. Absolutely. I mean, the biggest problem is that, you know, we are working with a hundred year old vapor compression technology where even the best in class room air conditioning systems have only achieved around 14% of the theoretical maximum efficiency. You know, and our research within RMI suggests that 
the entry level air conditioners are only six to eight percent of the theoretical maximum efficiency. So in terms of energy consumption, you know, if the room air conditioners that are sold in the market today keep getting sold, we will need around four thousand new power plants. Uh, to supply the electricity that they need to operate every single year. And that is roughly the amount of electricity consumption of US, Japan, and Germany combined. So they're highly inefficient. So inefficient, like less than 10% <laughs> of efficient. That's why it's wild to think about. <laughs> exactly. And and not just, you know, you know, efficiency is part of the, the, the equation, but it's, you know, the, the emissions from cooling come through two sources there's uh there is of course the 20 to 30 percent of emissions that come from using um high polluting refrigerants but the remaining 70 to 80 percent actually comes from uh the fossil fuel based electricity that these con- appliances consume and like i said they're highly inefficient uh which is what makes the problem uh, manifold but even on the refrigerant side i would say that the refrigerants are using uh, HFCs for the most part these days for cooling and uh, unfortunately these HFCs are over a thousand times more potent than CO2 in terms of their global warming potential and while they're short-lived uh, the potent the potential actually matters totally totally um, yeah I mean I can only imagine um, so l- walk us through like how did you bring innovators together in order to reimagine what cooling could look like yes so you know we we started this prize we we designed the prize based on you know the the climate impact criteria as well as the affordability criteria and then we had supplementary criteria around uh, power water refrigerant use uh, etc so we had several of you know these design criteria that we set up and we basically went ahead and invited um, innovators from around the globe and around 2,100 teams from 95 con- countries registered for the prize of which 139 teams actually submitted detailed technical applications of their ideas and eight of them were shortlisted um, from amongst these ideas as, as finalists um, in 2019 and so what happened after that is that we requested the eight finalists to submit two prototypes of their solutions uh, for testing in both the real world condition as well as lab uh, labs in India. And um, four of the finalists actually completed the full testing phase of the prize. And, um, you know, two finalists actually exceeded our criteria, which is mind boggling because, yeah. you know, when <laughs> we started the prize, it was like um, we were definitely dealt with a lot of skepticism around uh, you know, is that even possible? Like, are you guys out of your mind? You're looking at, uh, you know, something that's five times better or 80% better. Like, right, which is such it, a moonshot. <laughs> it is a moonshot. And if we had it, we would have deployed it. It was, you know, one of the comments from one of the largest conditioning manufacturing companies. And um, I remember being, going to China, uh, talking about the price, um, and this guy from one of the leading manufacturing companies, he was like just scratching his head, doing all the calculation and was like, this doesn't make sense. It's impossible. And that's when, you know, <laughs> uh, he was accompanied by some of the researchers in the room and they said, no, no, let, let's let's try to make it possible. I think that it is, it is possible because the RMI team has put in some analytical rigor to come up with these, uh, you know, considerations and and you know fast forward um in april 2021 uh team daikin which is the world's largest hvac and refrigeration company and team gri which is the world's largest room air conditioning manufacturer um were both selected as winners of the prize so cool so what comes next for them how do we deploy this technology at scale yeah, you know, for us, what was important was to showcase the world where the ceiling is and what's possible. And with this demonstration complete, we know that the cooling dilemma of really providing access to cooling without further warming our planet can really be solved. And while we acknowledge, you know, innovation is only part of the solution, uh, that we still need 
you know, we have a lot of work to do in terms of shaping this market for super efficient technologies. And this would in, involve pushing for stronger demand signals, stronger policy mandates. Um, but at, at present, you know, um, at the last COP, both the teams committed to uh, manufacturing their solutions at scale, uh, which is, I think, the biggest win we could have had from a from an innovation price perspective. Absolutely. That is so cool. Um, and has, yeah, just so much potential for very real impact. Um, I'm curious how, and this is like, kind of like a philosophical question, um, <laughs> but, but what, what role do you think collaboration can play or how do you think collaboration can help us address um, some other, uh, you know, big climate impacts that we currently have? So in my opinion, you know, radical collaboration among, um, you know, policymakers, among industry, among the, the demand side, as well as uh, the finance community is, is almost key to progress on any of the climate solutions that we need to develop. Uh, and I say that because, you know, if, if the industry or the business could do it on their own, they would have done it already. The reason they haven't done it uh, or haven't come up with the solutions at scale is because they need all of these other signals of certain of market certainty in order to drive solutions to market. And um, in my opinion, you know, collaboration not just not not just across this value chain of actors, but also across the NGO community is really important because we do not have time. It's the decisive decade. Uh, if we lose time now, we we will not be able to achieve. Um, you know, our commitments on the Paris Accord. And there is there is no time left uh, to, to brainstorm anymore. We need to act now. Uh, we absolutely do. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I, you know, and I think, um, you know, collaboration is a situation, you know, many times highly effective collaborations where like one plus one can equal five. Um, and I think it's, I think we've done a lot of the, a lot of the one plus one equals two math <laughs> that we can do. And now we really do need that multiplier effect. Couldn't agree more with you, Liz. I, I think it, it's almost critical um, because this is not, this is, this is everyone's problem right now. This is not something that can be solved in a silo. We need to work uh, closely together and really push the impact. And it's you know the the example again is the pandemic. Like you couldn't achieve what you did to combat this pandemic and make this pandemic go from the pandemic level to an endemic level without radical collaboration. And and that's what we need again to tackle this climate crisis. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, um, you know, I ask a lot of people who work on um, specifically in the climate space, this question. I mean, I think it's relevant for people doing impact work broadly as well, but uh, what helps you sleep at night <laughs> while you do this work? And um, what makes you most optimistic about the future? It's, you know, there are some tough nights, let's just say that, <laughs> because it's not always easy um, to you know, go back to sleep assured that you have solved the problem. Um, this is a very challenging domain. You know, we're looking at impacts that are going to come both, you know, this year, but also years to come. And no matter what we do, the 1.5 degree future is very, very hard to attain. So there are definitely sleepless nights I get or thinking about that problem or that existential question. Um, but, you know, the fact that everyone's sort of now rising to the table and uh, rising to the challenge rather um, gives me hope. Uh, at this last COP, we have more than 80% of global GDP and uh, roughly 77% of the global greenhouse gases covered by a national net zero target. That wasn't the case before. And while these targets are certainly not the end all of, of it all, these signal hope and promise and uh, and that's what we need in order to get the work done. So I, I feel like there's definitely pockets of hope I get from um, the wave of commitments that are coming through, but, but that's only half uh, the job. Uh, I think what keeps me up at night is how are we going to accomplish the other half of the job is of actually getting solutions on the ground at scale, which do not exist today. Um, and, and, you know, 
as you as I think about what keeps me optimistic is is the fact that I am a mother and I can't stress enough how important this fight is to me now and um I really do want my son to experience the beauties of of this planet of this na- of nature and as I have been able to experience and and pass um you know the next generation the baton um to to live in a happier world and for that it needs to be all of us in this fight and and we need to sort of yeah, you know pull our sleeves up and 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 get to it we really we really do need to and i know um for so many you know mothers in particular but certainly not exclusively mothers um i it's this is mm-hmm. it's so existential i think having a child can really put that into perspective Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm curious for any women who are listening, who are hoping to do more or hoping to be a, you know, play a bigger role in the flight, in the uh, fight, um, against, <laughs> against climate change, uh, what advice do you have for them? You know, I've been thinking about this a lot, Liz, and I feel that a lot of, uh, the professions that we have today or, or opportunities we have today, um, you know, you can make them into your fight for climate change. No, nothing's really out of question at this point. Like every profession can contribute to the solutions. Everybody at an individual level can be contributing to the solutions. And I just encourage all the women to really join this fight against climate change. We are crucial. We're this, you know, we're the fifty percent of this planet. And um, you know, if we put our minds to something, we're able to accomplish a lot. And so, I'd urge all women out there to to fight against the climate change through uh, at the level that they want to, right? Like you could do that at your household level. You could do it at a personal level. You could do it in the purchases, in the purchases you make. Um, but you could also do it at your, at your uh, you know, if you're working, you could do it at a, at a corporate level and, and be that advocate uh, who is thinking about this, who is bringing these issues to the fore because every decision counts. And, and it's, it's people uh, like us, it's women like us who will be able to uh, contribute to solutions um, more dramatically and accelerate the progress, honestly. And and for that, we just need to think through that frame uh, or, or that lens or that perspective and, and basically join the fight at any level that we are. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more. And I think it's often... Uh... A misperception, I don't want to say misperception, but I think, you know, often a lot of it, like, seems as though if you want to be a part of the fight against climate change, you know, one of the best ways to do it is by having a a job, either an organization that's explicitly focused on climate or having a climate-specific role. But honestly, I think having Mm -hmm. climate advocates in other roles within companies and organizations is just as important, right? It's going to take all of us. And so if, you know, if, if your job title today is not necessarily something that's climate specific, um, there may be opportunities and there may in fact be more opportunities for you to use your voice where you are to help accelerate climate action. Couldn't agree more with you, Liz, because that's what's needed, right? Like climate action is needed at every single level. Um, and the more we talk about it, educate, the more we advocate for it, the more we participate in that discussion um, and, and take actions, the faster the progress will be towards solutions. Definitely. And, and we need and we need them as fast as possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need them yesterday. <laughs> Totally. Um, well, and, and in the theme of yesterday, I'm curious, I love asking people this question. Um, you know, I think, you know, when I think back to some of the things I wish I could tell my younger self, <laughs> uh, there's quite a few. Um, and I, I think often, you know, for people who are maybe looking up to you and the work that you're doing, it might be interesting to hear what you wish you could tell your younger self. And so if you want to pick a certain age or just give some like generic younger self advice. I would love to hear um, what comes up for you when I ask that question. <laughs> um, I'm I'm not gonna put it in age because you know that realization could come to anyone at any point. But but um, the two things I guess I would tell my younger self is one to take risks. Um, it's so important to get out of your comfort zone to 
to really be able to you know um, accelerate your learning journey on, on anything that you want to learn and I, I found that through that internship that I talked about at the start of this interview uh, but also in, in different work circumstances like I took the the less traveled path sometimes um, just to challenge myself uh, and and take those risks and, and uh, you know follow my heart in order to to really learn and I, I've experienced that those opportunities have allowed me to learn the most and so I would say take more risks um, you may fail and, and it's it's totally fine because even failure and I would say failure gives you more learning than than your successes but it's so important to take risks and get out of your comfort zone uh, to do what you think is best. Um, and then the second is really believing in myself. I, I, I feel like for the most part of my life, I've I've been rather underconfident in what I can achieve as an individual. You know, um, I've al- almost had that imposter syndrome that I think a lot of women do have now that I think about it. Um, and I And I think it's important to know that not that nobody's got the right answer nobody's got the right perspective and that you need to believe in yourself and then you know give it your all um to succeed and so i i would tell my younger self to to really believe in those moments when you think you're like no i i don't think i have it or i don't think i've got it in me to be able to do this it's just that's the inspiration we need we need to believe in ourselves and you know get along with that imposter syndrome and say it doesn't matter fake it till you make it (laughs) um but that's the the advice I would those are the two pieces of advice I would give my younger self as I look back into my life uh I so I so appreciate that and I loved your framing of failure I think one of the quotes that really helped me reframe failure is this idea that failure is information that you couldn't get any other way Oh, um, yeah, definitely. I'm adding it to my quotable quote. <laughs> oh my gosh, I love it. I definitely did not write it. Um, and but I, I just remember like so often in in those moments where I was feeling like right up against mm-hmm. my edge, like that that as a mantra felt so helpful, <laughs> like as an 100%. an encouraging you know guiding light of like take the risk, um, believe in yourself, and if it doesn't go the way you wanted it to go, you learn something. <laughs> You definitely learn something. I, I've learned the most from my failures and I'm not afraid of them anymore. Um, not that I enjoy them, <laughs> but I'm not afraid. <laughs> Amazing. Um, well, I'd love to hear you, you said quote, your list of quotable quotes. Uh, I love quotable quotes. Um, and so I would love to hear like what's, <laughs> what's your favorite inspirational quote right now? Yeah, um, I feel like this one really resonates with me right now and for, I don't know for what reason but it does it's it says you're braver than you believe you're stronger than you seem and you're smarter than you think mm, I love that is that attributed or is that just us on the list from we don't know where uh, I I don't know who who wrote it but someone who did was definitely smarter <laughs> than I thought <laughs> I don't know who wrote it, but I have it like written down somewhere and um, I just love it. I keep referring back to it when I, you know, when I have those crazy moments <laughs> and it gives me hope. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I love that. Um, and I'm a sucker for an inspirational post-it note. Um, one of the, the <laughs> not not at all secret dreams of, for me and this podcast is that one day there's going to be like a I will be able to sell a like stack of pre-populated post-it notes with like inspirational phrases on them. Um, so I love that. I'd love to get a, I'd love to get that whole stack of post-it notes. I think it's a great idea. Liz. Thank you. <laughs> I just think it. It, it'd be so fun. Yes. Yeah, so like stick them all over and like, you can just like pull from the deck and see what the wisdom is from, from some other awesome woman. Um, is there any other quote that comes to mind? If we, you could have your own Radhika, posted uh, with an inspirational quote is there something that you'd want to make sure we get into the deck ha huh, very nice um you mean my own quote like if I had one yeah I mean it doesn't have to be your own I guess there's any other um like quotable quote that comes to mind uh that you think might benefit some other women out there yeah I think it's a four word one and I don't know if somebody's written this before but here's how I would put it if it's put down in a post-it note I'd say you can do this. Uh, <laughs> it's 
cliche, but it works. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it totally (laughs) does. I think we all uh, need that reminder on a sometimes daily, sometimes hourly, (laughs) sometimes more often than that. Uh, Well, thank you so much. Uh, Just a couple more questions for you. Uh, The first is, what are you, I like to end on a positive note, um, what are you most looking forward to right now? Absolutely. On the work front, I'm um, I'm very excited about sort of doubling down some of my efforts um, on these hard to obey sectors, but also looking very squarely at the concrete sector and its decarbonization. So I'm, I'm thinking of doubling down on that. Um, and on the personal front, I am looking forward to visiting my family after uh, the insane pandemic lockdown where I wasn't able to see them. Uh, yes, uh, I'm so glad that you'll get a chance to see them. I think uh, the possibility of travel and reunion uh-huh. is giving so many of us life right now. Right. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot tell you how much. <laughs> Counting days. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, um, for people who listen and want more Radhika in their lives, um, is there a good place for people to find you, keep in touch with you, keep up with this like awesome work that you are doing? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think people can connect with me on LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, my name is Radhika Lalit and you know, you can find me both on LinkedIn and Twitter. Feel free to connect with me and um, I'd love to yeah, continue the conversation. Amazing. Uh, Well, thank you so much for making the time to come on the podcast. It has seriously been such a treat to sit down with you. Um, I'm so inspired by the work that you're doing and feeling so energized and hopeful on the climate action front. So thank you so much for that much needed dose. Thank you, Liz. And and the feeling is absolutely mutual. I'm a big fan. uh, And so thank you for, for doing this for all the women. I think it's it's this podcast that keeps me happy. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. That's high praise coming from you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Well, thank you again. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of the Women Changing the World podcast. Please rate and review the Women Changing the World podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Google Podcasts. And don't forget to subscribe for future episodes. You can find me on Instagram. My handle is Liz.Best, that's L-A-S dot B-E-S-T, or you can find me on LinkedIn by searching my name, Liz Best. Join my mail list by visiting ElizabethBest.com slash monthly meditation, and you'll receive all the latest updates on events, retreats, and opportunities to work with me, plus a monthly love note from my heart to your inbox. I am so excited to keep in touch, and I'll see you in the next episode.